March of 1994. I did have a little break, but it was just about eight month break service, and then I came back in. What branch of the service were you in? Army National Guard. And what was your highest rank? In, in the National Guard, it was Sergeant First Class, E7. So back in 1964 is when you joined? Yes. Where were you living at the time? I was living in East Haven, Connecticut. And why did you enlist? Well, it's probably because um, I almost went into the Navy, but then I had a grandfather who served in this in the regiment we're in now or with the museum, the 102nd. And the, the family history has all been Army. And I think I would have, my grandfather had passed away, but I thought he would be turning over in his grave if I joined the Navy. <laughs> so you chose the Army? Did you yes. enlist in the regular Army or the National Guard? Right? National Guard, because he was in the National Guard in New Haven. He, he served in uh, the Mexican border in the First World War. He was an officer in the 102nd. So that was in January of 1964. When you uh, first enlisted, what did, what did you do? Did they send you to basic training? How did I, the National Guard work? In 1964, um, in January of 64, I enlisted and they sent me to Fort Dix, New Jersey for uh, six months training as a uh, light vehicle truck driver. I, I started out as a truck driver. And did it was, you have experience driving trucks? No, it was something I had to learn. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so you went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for six months? Yes, yes. And what uh, what was that like? Well, the first ten weeks were basic training, of course, and you went through the, the regular, regular role of basic training and learning how to be a soldier and how to act as a soldier and how to, you know, Take a lot of baloney too, but you learn to do that in life anyway. But it was, it was an experience. I'm glad I went through. Believe it or not, I know. Do you recall any of your instructors from basic training? Oh yes, I remember. Uh, and I remember his name. My first sergeant was a Fred Fred Woods, uh, and he come out the first day when we got in a basic training company and told us. I'm going to welcome you to Fort Dix, New Jersey, Company D, 3rd Trainer Regiment. Uh, I am going to be your mother, and this is how he said it, your mother, your father, you know, your minister, whatever, but I'm not your girlfriend. <laughs> and that's how he, uh, and that's, it went through, I mean, there were times, they were tough times, you know, they harassed you, you know, and, and my platoon sergeant, was another gentleman, but his last name was Mitchell. I don't have remembering all these names, but you know, there's certain things in your life to remember. And his last name was Mitchell, Sergeant Mitchell. And he was tough, but he was also, he was, uh, he, he knew what we were going through. And, you know, of course, in 1964, in January 1964, there wasn't that much going on in the world. Vietnam was just starting to kick up. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, Army training was, I guess I would have to say, an awakening to my future of what was going to happen to me, you know. After the first 10 weeks of just the very basic, um, then you started the truck training? Yes, I went to, uh, <clears throat> in fact, it was a, I was, in, I was in Delta Company, the third, and they sent us over to another company in the old third training regiment. It was at Fort Dix, and yeah, that's where we got trained on how to drive trucks. So I had about, I guess it was five weeks of going to school, dry, light vehicle driver school, and then they assigned you to different companies, and I was assigned to the second training regiment as a, as a Jeep driver for this, their regimental sergeant major. And that was lovely. After that, it was great living at Fort Dix. I was home every weekend. And, of course, my father asked me, are you in the Army or not, you know? 
What other vehicles? So you, they taught you how to drive a Jeep. And what other vehicles did uh, you drive? A two and a half ton truck, uh, up to a five ton truck. That's what we were trained to do because the 1048 at that time was a light vehicle uh, company, a uh, drive company. And what their mission was back in Connecticut was they were supporting all the battalions that were in the state. They were, they were the transportation support for the infantry battalions uh, in the state. After you finished your truck training and all of your basic at Fort Dix, where did you go? I ended up going back to Connecticut, coming back to Connecticut and uh, joining back to the 1048th in Brantford. <clears throat> what can you tell me about the 1048th? Well, I, I still see some guys once in a while from the old timers, and one guy I do remember is a, a gentleman by the name of Fergus Mooney. Mooney, he was my first sergeant. Heck of a great guy, and in fact, he probably fo I followed him through. Well, he followed me in my military career because when I ne next up was going to the two hundred eighth Engineer Group on Iron Street, New Haven. And he was the first sergeant there. And uh, after that, I went to the Army. Uh, after the 208, I went to the uh, 242nd Engineers for a while. I didn't see him. But then when I came back in, I back to Brantford again. It was C Troop 26 Cavalry. He was my first sergeant again. And the, the greatest thing was, after I retired and joined the Governor's Foot Guard, he was an officer in the governor's foot guard. <laughs> wow, so he's yeah. been following you your he, entire career? Yeah, in my entire career, yes. Uh, what were your duties at, uh, in Brantford at the 1048? Oh, well, I was, as I said, I was a truck driver. And so you still stayed on as a truck driver? Yeah, in the 1048 I did, but in the 208 I became a, I went, I became a cook. <laughs> did you, um, so when you were stationed at Brantford, what were your duties as far as National Guard? What were your responsibilities? Because it wasn't full-time, right? No, it was part-time. So it was what they call end-day. In other words, uh, every weekend, the, on the weekend drills, we had, would go support one of the infantry battalions with their transportation, whether we went to Camp Lyannick, which is Camp Lyannick. At that time, it was Camp Rebukov. And uh, we would support the infantry battalions. We would go to the armories, different armories in the state, like Manchester or... Waterbury, wherever, and and we would be the transportation to move the troops to, to the training. And the same way, when we went to our annual training, we were there to support the battalions. Did you have guard every weekend? One weekend a month. It was, so it was one weekend a month, yes. and, how long, and for how long in the summer? Uh, two weeks in the summer. But I, myself, I do about two and a half weeks because I always went on what they call the advanced party because you had a couple extra days to before the training started, to maybe go out and enjoy yourself, you know, out to the club or something, you know. Where did you do the annual training? Was it always in Connecticut? No, our annual training was usually a 12-hour, 13-hour ride up to Fort Drum, New York, which is upstate New York and Watertown, so. And uh, it wasn't until the, la the later 60s that we went to different places. So from 64 to 66, really, there wasn't a lot of action with the Vietnam War. Um, did you realize that the Vietnam War was heating up and that we were going to have a presence there? Yeah. When, at what point did you realize that? It was more when they got into the 208th Engineer Group than the 1048 because uh, we were sort of on on the, um, I would say the word was, uh, we on the, I'll say docket possibly be called up for at that one time to go to Vietnam. It didn't happen, but there because was a potential. That was there was a potential to go. It's two way engineer group, yes. When did you transfer from the ten forty eight to the two oh eight? That was nineteen sixty six and at that time I became a full time member of the guard for a while. I was the what they call the uh, administrative supply technician and I stayed on there until oh I did that for about a year or so, but in the meantime, I I changed my MOS again and, and became a. I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, for training. So. 
Do you rec All right, so when you went to the 208, was that still right here in Connecticut? Where did you report to work every day? That, that was at Orange Street in New Haven. It was the old Orange Street Armory. It's right near where, uh, not too far from Wilbur Cross High School is today. But it was uh, right on Orange Street. Today it's a, believe it or not, it's a, um, an apartment house. They made apartments, uh, apartment house out of the armory. And at that time, it was the New Haven Armory. It was, it was no, it was the Orange Street Armory, not the New Haven Armory. That was on Gough Street. When you would go to work every day at the Orange Street Armory, what were your duties? I was it a regular it, nine to five? Thing? It was a regular nine to five job. I was admit what they call it in charge of administration, doing two hundred one files and. Anything that had to do with the uh, the administration of the unit itself, and then of course we were all, uh, during that time, the next few years. What happened was the unit was disbanded. They disbanded. They were making it up. They were changing units again because that happens every once in a while, even in the guard. You know, a lot in the guard, they'll change the units to something else or eliminate the unit because. They got something else coming in that will bring in the state more money as far as I'm concerned. So we were we were gonna be we were gonna be disbanded. I ended that's how I ended up in the two forty second engineers in you Stratford. You changed your MOS, was that while you were in the two oh eighth or when you yeah. went to the two forty second? When I was in the two oh eighth, I went to Fort Lee, Virginia in uh God, that was, I think it was an exact, exact month, I think it was around November. Yeah, November of 66, I went to Fort Lee to go to Cook and Baker School. Why did you decide to change it to? Well, we just, I, I just said, uh, I looked for something else to do, and it was something to better my education, I guess, or better my, I feel, my, I was saying, better my career, maybe, because... How long were you at Fort Lee? I was at Fort Lee for, I believe it was close to four months. Exact time, I can't remember now. It's been, and I went to, we, and you had to, at, those, at that time, you had to be, um, you went to, in those days, when you cook, went to cook school, you had to learn everything. Not like it is today, everything's in a can. You had to learn how to, to bake Basically, take a recipe and go from scratch to bake, to meat cutting. I mean, you know, really, beef cutting. You had to cut a side of beef. You had to do turkeys. You had to do chickens. You had to do pork. And you had to do everything besides learn how to be an NCO, too. You know, learn how to be a leader. And uh, it was, uh, I found it very interesting and uh and I should say, you know, today the cooks don't do what we used to do. If I talk to young, younger soldiers today about how it's changed so much as far as doing food service, because in those days, you had, not only did you have to learn how to cook, you had to learn how to operate the field equipment that you went out to cook out in the field. Yeah, and that must be interesting because you had to be able to cook with huge numbers of people. What kind of field equipment at, at that time would you use? Well, we had what they call at that time the M1937 field range, which was a gasoline-operated stove, okay? And it cooked, and if you were in a company, you had three of them, you had to cook, at least cook for two, you could cook for 250 men. So you went out and you, first you, again, in those days, everything was basic. When you're out in the field, you had a mess tent, and you did all the baking and then the, and the cooking of the meals and right in that tent. Right in that tent was where it now was. Now these stoves were run by gasoline. Yes, yes. And it was it was actually air pressure it was you, the gas the gas would um, you had to pump up the pressure to a certain amount it would mix the gas and air together in the in a, what they call the generator. The fire would go up and you could. You know, that's how you cooked. Almost like, you cooked like mommy, but you had just some different equipment, you know. What, um, you'd have to learn how to feed them three meals a day? Yeah, we were doing three, at those days, we were doing what they call three A meals a day. So we were putting in eight, sometimes 18 hours a day in the kitchen. And if you were a company mess, all you had was five cooks. 
when it got back to the guard. So now he went out in the field and he had each separate company mess, had five cooks, maybe six cooks. And you would uh, do probably 18 hours a day, get about six hours sleep, and you're up again cooking the breakfast, the lunch, and the dinner. And it was what are a, a meals? Are these uh, like means full like meals? like mom like mommy cooked. Okay. So give me an example of what they'd get for breakfast. Breakfast out in the field, you would get eggs, uh, bacon, ham, whatever the menu called for, because you got what they call a master menu, and you would go to that master menu for that day, and it could be. Pancakes, it could be eggs, it could be SOS, which is, I won't say the word. <laughs> they didn't get just like a bowl of cereal. Ever. No, you you could get, uh, what you tried to do for out in the field we, it was uh, do the best you could as far as getting them a regular meal like that so they could eat and have a full meal. And again, the next thing you do would be a lunch and with the unit I was in, they wanted three A's, what they call three A's a day. It wasn't until it got further where you did a breakfast in the morning, either gave them C rations, which is, you know, the C rations, and then further on in the, in the system, uh, along the line, and it got uh, into the 80s and the uh, 70s and eight, late 70s and 80s, we went to MREs, and that's what they had today. You know, the meal ready to eat, and you have served them an A meal for breakfast, a, a what we call a a combat meal for lunch, and then supper usually was again another hot meal. And then at nighttime, when we were out in the field, it was winter time, we'd always bring out soup to the troops in different areas so they'd have soup before they went to sleep, you know, or after the training, you know, because this was all during training too. It wasn't where you were in actual combat at the when time. When you were training at Fort Lee, did you have to actually cook the three meals a day and serve them to troops? Yeah, after we got through with the school, they assigned you to different companies, and you so were. So that gave you opportunity to practice. Gave you uh, the practice what you were you were taught, and you uh, cooked the three meals. Of course, you were working in a mess hall, and most of the time on active duty, at, at Fort Lee, you would be working in the mess hall. They did take you out at times to train you on the field equipment. They trained you on the field equipment, but uh, I remember being assigned to a company mess as a cook for the time I was stationed there until I got sent back to the guard. As a cook and baker, um, are you responsible for just preparing and serving the food, or do you have to also be the person that orders it um, and makes the menus? Oh, I, I ended up being, because I ended up being a food service sergeant, yeah, and that was your responsibility. You also had a, not only had the responsibility to order the food, you also had a responsibility to keep, keep it in what the money was allowed to buy the food, especially on, on base. When you went out in the field, they called it the field rations. It was the same thing, uh, but you were you went by the numbers of people you had. When you back, got back in garrison on active duty, you had to fill out and keep a, a menu to your the money you were allowed for that month uh, and stay within that menu. And if you had a brain, you could say, well, we kept it fully all the way through, but if you weren't too smart, by the end of the month, no one even running out of money, you ended up with hot dogs and beans, you know, <laughs> or worse. <laughs> so they, the Army would give you your budget for the month, and you would have to make that? The, in the old days, that's the way you had a budget, and you, you had a master menu, but you had to stick to that budget. Who made the menu? Uh, usually it was the Department of the Army made the menu for you. You had what they call a master menu. I have out in the museum that we have some of those. But they had a master menu that you went by. And uh, <clears throat> you could change some stuff on it, but not much. You'd have to stay for that master menu. And where would you order your food from? Well, um, at, on base, it was from the ration breakdown. They had what they call ration breakdown, where you went and got the food from there. And when I got back to the guard, we would go either go to the sub base to draw the food, or in the uh, after we, uh, after a few years of the sub base, we ended up in the middle of town to the hospital. The state was issuing the money, or the food from the, from the middle of town hospital. Now with the state, they had their own master menus that they would put up that you would take out to the field. Um, officers uh, at that time paid for their meals. Enlisted didn't. 
So you had you had if you if you had 150 men in your company, you drew 150 men rations for 150, and you had what's called a head count, and you had to stay within a certain percentage of that head count. Uh, it was I believe it was three percent. You could not be over three percent overdrawn on your food for the for that weekend. So so you had to be a little tight on it, you know. You had to. But in, in all, I had never had any problem that I know of. But and but it all worked out in that everybody ate, or they better have eaten. I only did it once. It was that first sergeant I told you about. He came in one day. We had, I'll never forget. You know, you never forget things. And he come in. He was because the first senior NCOs were the last ones to eat. And he came in. We just got given the last serving. I'll never get out the last serving. He walked in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, top, you know. But I made him something, you know. But it wasn't what was on the menu, you know. And, but it happened again, of course, you know. But <laughs> after your time at Fort Lee, did you go back to um, Orange Street, or had that unit disbanded? No, that that unit. I went to camp with that unit for. Uh, God, it was a year, oh, well, a year and a half. I was still in that unit for about a year and a half. And we went to Fort Drum. And no, in, in the spring, we went to Fort Drum. And it snowed up there in, in April. It snowed. I'll never forget that one, too. But, uh, yeah, I ran the kitchen. I was the first cook at the time. At Fort Drum? At Fort Drum, yeah. And when, when you did that, did you just have to worry about your company? Yes, yes. So how many men was that you were feeding? I believe we had about 100, and at that time, we had about 170 people to feed every meal. And did you give them the three A's? Yeah, it was three A's all the time, three hot meals. What would a typical day when you were working up at Fort Drum be like? Like what time would you get up, how well, long? We usually got up around, I'd say 3, 30, 4 o'clock. In the morning? In the morning, do breakfast. Now, because when you cook the meal, you had to either serve it in the in the rear area or you had to put it in what they call mermite cans and ship it out to the guys where they're training. So, you know, so he was getting up, getting the meal done, getting it ready, and be, uh, and be there on time. Chow was, it was say, at 6 o'clock. Chow better be there and ready at 6 o'clock, you know, so... It wasn't, it was, you know, you didn't have to go out and play the play the war games, but you had to make sure they ate, you know. So it was, you know, it wasn't easy. Because, so know. then you got breakfast done out of the way, you served it, whether it was in the field or in the mess hall. Yeah. Did you have to do the cleanup too? No, we had KPs. We helped clean up, but we had what they call KPs. Those were the guys that came in and washed pots and pans and, of course, on the field you have you had your mess kit, so we had what they call mess kit laundry, where they would troops would wash their own mess kits. But we had to have hot water and boiling water and stuff, and that real hot water to wash the pots and pans and clean up the equipment for the next meal. You know. Did you have a break between breakfast and lunch, or did, as soon as breakfast was done, were you starting the lunch? No, we'd have maybe if we were lucky, we'd have a half hour break. You know, but you're still you were. Cleaning up, anyway, because we said what they had to say, clean as you go as you're doing the meal. You cleaned up what you had to do after you did a certain item, and you started, and then get it all cleaned up, and you're ready to go for the next meal. And uh, I, it was I, it was hard, but it was something I would say that most of the guys that work hooks, they know they accomplished something. They were taking care of the and they always wanted to make sure the guys ate. You know, it wasn't where I oh, hell with them. Was, they made sure they ate, you know. Yeah, I'm sure they you were know. appreciated by yeah. the Yeah, some guy, but, but there were a few guys, and I could tell you stories about some guy. Some guy, in, in, when I ended up back in Brantford as a mess sergeant, some guy came in complaining about the food, and I'm standing there. I actually reached over the counter and grabbed the guy and said, you know, a few choice words, and, you know, you know. 
keep it up, I'll put your face on the grill, you know? Because <laughs> that does aggravate you after you've done all that work and you got so many of you think she's that you can't cook as good as my mother. That's what he said. I said, well, go home, you know? <laughs> what else can you say? And be nice about it? No, not really. Yeah, but yeah. When, and then when you finished the lunch, did you have any time before you had to start dinner? Or was this like a full day thing? You know, you finish one meal, you start the next, you finish that, you start the next? Well... A full day was, yeah, you had, you still had to clean up and get your equipment cleaned and everything else. And, and of course, re -get, put gasoline back in the equipment so you could cook the meal. You, I would say you probably had a half an hour of downtime before you went to start the supper meal, you know. So then when could you leave for the day? When would your day be done? Well, mostly, now, now again, if you were out in the field, um, the guys would go out, out in the field to feed the troops. Now you did have to wait for them to come back with the equipment so you could clean it again, you know. So when you did that, of course, you probably got to bed about maybe 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you know. And then we got to the point where we we did get more guys on the cooks too, uh, more cooks. And, and, you know, you gave some guys some time off, you know, but... Uh, because mostly on, on active duty, you were on for a full day or two full days, then you had a day off. But in the guard, it was different because you were out there only for two weeks. So you were putting your time in to cook the meals, you know. So, Fred, that was a pretty long day, but you would, you would typically work one day, two days on and one day off? Oh, when I was, yeah, I was... On active duty, uh, on, a, on a military post, if you were in garrison, but if with us guys in the guard, and all the cooks that were in the guard will tell you, uh, it was different than being on active duty with the regular service because you're only there for a week or two weeks. So you ended up cooking every meal that you were there for the two, for the two weeks. You there was get days off then. Uh, you get time off. We would get, I made sure that when I became a mess sergeant that the guys got time off, you know. That wouldn't hurt me because I'm sitting there just doing administration. I can get off my rear end and get out there and help the kids cook a meal or go, go take a break. You you know, it's if you were uh, any sort of a person who cared about the guys who work for you, you took care of them that way, you know. If I knew how to cook, so why, why you know, Take a break, kid. Get away from the kitchen. Get away from the stove for a while. Go take a break. Fred, you know? to learn to be a cook, and especially a cook for huge numbers that you'd have to cook for, um, I know a lot of a lot of civilians have a problem um, coordinating when when to put certain items in so that your dinner comes out or your lunch or your, all at the same time. Do you, and some people have that ability, and some people don't, so that you might end up with. Yeah, you know, well, the, the meat not done or the vegetable not right. Well, you had what you call a recipe. They call them recipe cards at the time. And it had the recipe, and it didn't teach you how to cook for five people. You were cooking the rest. Of, each recipe was for a hundred people. So if you were cooking for two hundred people, we'll say, and it called for twenty-five pounds of hamburger for the meal. Now you know you're cooking fifty pounds of hamburger for that meal. And it would give you the time and, and the ingredients, what put so much for so much into so much to make the recipe. And that's how you did the cooking. And then also, when you served it, it also gave you what the portion size was. So in other words, this, the guy at the head of the chow line, the guy at the end of the chow line got the same food, you know. And that was... That was part of the deal, you know. You're gonna you make sure everybody eats the same, whether it's the first guy in the chow line or the last guy in the chow line. If they wanted to go back for seconds, could they? If we had enough, or like we were like we used to say overdrawn. Say, say we drew for 175 people and we only fed 160. Now there's 10 rations that are left over. If we couldn't use it in a say uh, something else, we would say, "Come on, seconds for anybody who wants it." You can get up to who's ever it's first come, first serve on the seconds, you know. 
But there's always a chance you call seconds anyway, because that was the thing. Get rid of the food, because especially if you're out in the field, you had no no refrigeration to keep it. Again, you know, we had ice and stuff. We had ice chests and stuff to keep the food that was supposed to be kept cold. But, you know, you want to take care of the troops, you know. Did you have to cook the prescribed recipe cards? Could you ever be creative and cook something of, of your own? Yeah, well, that's that's funny. Huh? Mm-hmm. To think of, to think of when because when I left the sea troop, I went to the when I went back to to Brantford, I was in sea troop. But after that, I went to the brigade headquarters as the food service supervisor because I got promoted up to seven by then, and uh, I was in charge of all the kitchens in the brigade as an advisor. In other words, I'd go around and make sure they were doing their job right. It wasn't as an inspector, but as an assistant. So if a guy did something wrong, you told him what he did wrong, you know. And if he did the same thing again, then you gave him a little trouble, you know. But that my job was to make sure that the kitchens ran smooth and uh, it was really enjoyable to help get the guys out. But... Uh, yeah, it was. What did I was I saying? Uh, Were you ever creative? Could you cook up? Your oh, own oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because what happened was, uh, we always the um, uh, one of the guy, the menu called for. I'm, not, I'm going back now, up into the eighties. Now we got what they call freeze dried shrimps in the cans, and if you put them together right, you can make shrimp cocktail with them. It was something that though they were giving us. And the kid came up to me and said, Sergeant, he said, we called for Creole shrimp. I said, no, none of these guys like Creole, because you get to know what your guys like and dislike. Can I do something, Sergeant? I said, what is it? I said, I want to make shrimp scampi. Now, get, you got to figure this out, you know. You're out in the field. You're in the woods. You're training. And they said, well, if you can do it and do it good, because I found out later on the kid was a chef and outside, outside the guard. So did he make shrimps? Oh, he made the shrimp scampi. It was beautiful. He did a beautiful job, you know, of course. And here you are going through the chow line in the mess kit and they're putting shrimp scampi in your mess kit. It was funny as heck, you know, because we were the only unit to serve some scampi. The radio units were, were serving shrimp creole, whatever it was. But you could, you could change... As long as you didn't change the heart of the menu, but if you changed something in the menu and made it better for the troops, that was okay. All right, so go back now. At, you were up at Fort Drum. Mm-hmm. Um, and what what year was that? For which which one? I mean, in the um, after you became a cook and baker, you went up to Fort Drum. Oh, that was sixty six, sixty uh, sixty six, and nineteen sixty seven. And after you finished at Fort Drum, where did you go? From Fort Drum, after they they, uh, disbanded the unit, I went to the 242nd Engineers. I ended up as a cook there, but I didn't last long. I think I lasted about uh, four drills in the 242nd Engineers. What's four drills mean? Yeah, four four weekends in the 242nd Engineers. And my company commander from the 208th, requested I come over to the Army Reserve with him to the 729th Transportation Company, which is a railroad outfit on Winter Green Avenue in the Army Reserve. So I got transferred to the Army Reserve for a year. Okay, so the Army Reserve that must have been, what, 1968? 60, yeah, yeah, that's right, 1968, you're right, because that's the year I got first got married. And, <laughs> and, you, and this was where? At Winter Green Avenue on... Uh, in New Haven, New by Haven. by Southern Connecticut University there, and uh, I wasn't still full time guard. No, no. So you were so that, that when I when I left the two hundred eighth and went to the two forty second, I was an end day again. I wasn't full time. So when, for the Army Reserve, was that the same as your National Guard duty, where you went? Once yeah, one week, one week, weekend, one weekend a month. But uh, come the. Uh, Company commander who asked me to come over there. I went over there with them, and I was with them for a year. But uh, I didn't like the unit. I was because it was a thing where 
There was a difference between that time between the reserve and the guard. What was the difference? Those guys never went out in the field. The reserve? Yeah, they, you know, it would be nice to sit in an office all day, and I became a, a, train, a trainman. You know, we went down to Fort Eustis, Virginia, and we were, on, we were on railroad trains, you know. And there was a, I was used to the first sergeant who took care of his men, and they had a first sergeant. All he cared was taking pictures. So I, after a while, you know, knowing that I could see that this guy wasn't, I didn't, it's probably a personality class. I went to my company commander and I said, I appreciate working with you, sir. Uh, in fact, I, the guy just passed away about a month ago. I used to do work for him, different things. And uh, we were close friends. And I told him I want to go back in the guard because I had a slot, a mess sergeant slot in Brantford at Sea Troop. So that's what he did. I transferred back to the uh, National Guard again after a year when in the 729th. And uh, I was a lot happier. And uh, I took over the mess section in, in uh, Brantford at the, 10, at the uh, C Troop 26 Cavalry. At that, that time, they were no longer the 1040th Trans Company. they become an armored cab unit. So back in Brantford, was it the same building you were in before? Oh, yeah. Everything yeah, was everything, was, everything was the same, you know. And uh, I knew most of the guys, you know, that were cooks. And some new guys I never met, but I knew a few of them, you know. What was your rank by that time? I was, a, I was an E5. I, e I got promoted to E6 when I got over to Brantford, sergeant for, uh, staff sergeant. And... Uh, I ran. The, I was. I was running the mess section. So your duties as, as a staff sergeant were. You were in charge of the mess section. I was in charge of the did mess section. Did you actually do the cooking anymore, or did you supervise no, I, everybody else? Truthfully, I had a bunch of great guys there that I didn't have to touch touch anything, and I, all all they wanted me to do was sit there with a the pencil and do the paperwork and do the cooks' worksheets and all the orders that had to be done. And these guys were, I have to say one thing, these guys made me, they were great. They were really great. They cared about how they, you know, in fact, we used to throw parties up at, when we went to camp. We'd have a party for the every, unit party every year. And we did all the cooking for the party, fancy hors d'oeuvres and everything. You know. and I wish I had those pictures. I don't have those pictures anymore. I lot well, when I got, when I was, my first marriage guy got divorced. I had left the stuff in the house, forgot all about them because, you know, going, oh. and they disappeared. How long did you stay with C Troop 26 Cal? I was with C Troop from, let me see, 68, 69. It was 1969 to about 19, I believe it was 1972 or 73. I'd have to go look at my files. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's when I was offered the food service job at Brigade as the advisor, a food service advisor. Some gentleman, warrant officer from, actually he used to be in the 102nd too, come down to the Army one day. Because so I just happened to be running, because we were in the 26th Division out of Massachusetts, and it seems that they liked and the, and when I was in C Troop, they liked the way I ran kitchens. Because they had 26th Division of guys out of Massachusetts. I guess they, I guess they didn't give a damn about that. Some of them, some of them, you know. And I used to run the food service schools at the squadron level because this warrant officer and a sergeant major came down and asked me to do the schools for them to teach their mess sergeant. Their mess sergeants had to be mess sergeants, so I was doing that for a couple of years too, besides my weekends with Sea Troop. And this warrant officer come down from brigade said, I need an assistant. Would you like to come up? And my first sergeant, my full-time first sergeant goes, nah, you don't want to do that. I said, yeah, I do, sergeant mate. You know, I want to, you know, if I can help more people. So I ended up, in, I think it was the 70, yeah. Uh, 
Probably, I can't think of the year now, but that's probably 78, 79. I went up, uh, before that, I went up to, uh, up to Brigade in that slot there. And So uh, wait, how long were you at Brigade? So you went up to Brigade around 78, 79? But the, I think it was 1978, yeah. And I stayed at Brigade until I retired my first time. And uh, I had 20, 20, 20, a little over 20 years. And in 1984, I got out for a year. 84. So you were at Brigade um, as a food service advisor for quite a while. What were Correct. your duties during that whole period of time? Again, was it two weeks in the summer and once a month? Two weeks in the summer, months in a month. Being in the Brigade, you had to go there every Monday night. They, every single Monday night? Every single Monday night. Week 50 weeks, well, Where depending on how Up in the, uh, the Brigade headquarters was at Brainerd Field in Hartford. So I was going from East Haven to Hartford, you know, quite a bit. But it was a good position. I got to know a lot more people, a lot of more friends, though, you know. It was, so what were your duties as a supervisor? Did you travel around? To different I went to different units. I came back to the battalion, came back to C Troop just to train a new mess sergeant, show him what he was doing wrong, if he was doing any. My job was to correct anything that might be wrong. You know, that was my job. They said, well, you're here to inspect. No, I'm not there to inspect. I'm here to help you. Now, if you if you do the same thing next time I'm here, now it's going to be, okay, you're in trouble. You know, and I used to keep it at my level. In other words, if the guy was goofing up, I'd say, I told my boss, this guy we got out of the talk with. We, and then we'd go together and talk with him. Straight now, because our next move is to see your company commander. You know, that we're either going to replace you if they had somebody to replace you, or. What was the biggest problem if you saw any problems at, at, at any of the places? What would it be? I don't know. It really, I I can't remember anything that would would get a guy in trouble. It was always just operational things that he wasn't doing right because there are regulations in running a kitchen that you're supposed to go by sanitary rate that's not sanitary just how to do the meal make sure you got the meal cards and everything is going the way it's supposed to go you know if i walked in the kitchen you know you could tell the cooks that knew something you know you got to make you got to make spaghetti meatballs today Where's the recipe card? Oh, come on, Sarge, you know. Because the guy was an experienced guy. What do you know? Because after a while, if you were an experienced, you didn't just put the stuff in, you cooked it, and you know what it was going. You know, if you got, you know. You were so long in food service. Did you know how to cook everything by memory that was on those recipe cards? Uh, so if somebody came in and said, Fred cooks spaghetti and meatballs, you would be able to do it? Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I could, but I always, always told them, take that recipe card in because you can be, you can, you can forget something because the recipe is a formula. We used to tell them the recipe it is a formula that, you know, it needs so much of this, so much of that, so much of that, and, you know, all together makes it, makes it a meal, makes it a pleasant meal for somebody to eat. What would you say was the favorite meal? <laughs> SOS. Really? All your years in... in I always and, think of SOS. Yeah. But, you know, you know, it was when you had to... Probably the... the you know, it was... Uh, favorite meals would be... I think would be mostly at breakfast when you got up in the morning, having a good, solid breakfast. What used to aggravate me, though, was the fact that uh, knowing I've been in the, in the food service line is when... We had a commander who wanted three A's a day, three hot meals a day. Now, it's 90 degrees outside there, and, you, and the menu, master menu calls for roast pork and gravy out in the field. After you got it, now you're going to give a guy roast pork and gravy and mashed potatoes and all that at noon time. And the next thing he's going to be doing is running up and down the hill playing soldier. Uh, no, we, we we always try to lighten the new meals up, but it just seemed was. You know, until somebody finally came along and listened to us, that lightened the new meal up for the guy who was out there training. 
Because we're going to give them, we'll make sure we give them a hot meal, but lighten up that menu for the, the new meals, you know. What would you say was the most hated meal? Hmm. Oh. Oh, what the heck. You know, I can't remember any right now. But uh, nothing major that they all grumbled about? Yeah, I think it was more like uh, when you had to cook the Spam. Okay. Because at times you'd have to, they would give you what you could, some of your hot meals considered what they'd give you B rations. And a B ration with the, like the canned corned beef, the canned spam, you know, and yeah, the canned corned beef was one of the things that guys, and I, you're thinking about things. I had a, a, a very close friend of mine, a Spanish, Puerto Rican fella, and his wife would make, what they call pastelillos, where you make it with canned um, corned beef, and it's a, a pasta. It's a pot, you know. You make it into a, like um, oh, how can I say? You 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 made the dough. You put the meat and you spiced up the meat. You put it and you made it and you baked them, cooked them. Well, all the guys complained about the, the, the canned corned beef. So no. We had we had a meal, and I said, We're gonna, "I'm going to teach you guys how to make a nice Spanish meal." And I made how to make the pasta legos. Now they come in and they grab, "Oh man, these are great!" <laughs> Didn't tell them to let they all ate that. Hey, you guys just ate canned corned beef, you know. <laughs> but I would say probably canned corned beef was the worst, and that were canned spam. That was spam, you know. No, because me, I like spam and eggs, but who knows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so then you had a brief a brief stay where you went back to being just a civilian in 1984. And yeah. And you decided to join again? What That's happened it? after I retired, I get a phone call one night from Frank Carano. Well, it was Frank Carano, but it was his first sergeant. Called me up and said, uh, would you like to come back in the guard? I said, for the money alone, yes, because at that time, you know, I said, yeah, uh, what do you want me to be? I want you to be A company, the mess sergeant. And he said, okay, and, and the reason a guy called me, he knew, he, make a long story short, he knew my brother-in-law, and he, he got all of my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law gave him my phone number and called me, and that's how I met, met up with Frank Carano, and what do we have here, some of the... Did you know Couple Frank at the time? You know, no, I didn't. So it was funny. I got to tell a story about him, too. Uh, you know, he, he made me the mess sergeant of A Company. And Where being was that located? In New Haven, in the Gough Street Army. Because then, from then on, my career was at the Gough Street Army. At the what army? Gough Street, in New Haven. Gough Street? And uh, G O F F E, sometimes. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, Excuse me, I was in A Company for about three months. Maybe, if I was lucky, three months. I was in New Haven, because uh, I thought I got to become New Haven Gray. But uh, they had a reorganization of the mess sections. So what happened was, each company had their own mess section. So each, they had a, each company had five guys in the mess sergeant, as a, as a cook, and mess sergeant. Well, they made what they call a consolidated mess operation in a battalion. So that, and they changed it. There was no separate company messes now. There was a consolidated mess section. And I became the, the battalion mess sergeant, the only one, because now you were, I was in charge of five kitchens in the battalion. Well, one kitchen, really. But they were located in all different, different armories. But we all got together out in the field consolidated together and cooked for the whole battalion. Well, that had to be pretty huge. How many men are you talking? You're talking, well, of course, I had more cooks now, too. You're probably talking about 400, 500, oh, more than that, about 600 men in the battalion at the you, time. You were in charge of cooking food for 600 men three yeah, meals well, a day? Yeah. And that's one thing God they started in the end of 
cutting it down to two meals a day and not three, so the guys could take breaks too, of course. But uh, two meals of, of hot meals and one combat meal, you know. When the day of the combat meal, lunch? Yeah, lunch time usually. And then when and when I was just about getting out, they were coming out what they call tray packs, which was they were actually they put them in a they were in a can. The whole meal was in the can, like and he would put it in the water and boil it and heat it up and then serve it to the troops. They they were good. They ended up being they were good meals. They were, some of them were real good. Some yeah, eh, you know, but uh, you would like to cook the A meals for the guys most of the time. You know. Well, since you had been in food service for so long and you had seen what it was like doing individual company mess and then when they consolidated and did the, the big battalion, was that a good move in your opinion? Did it make it more efficient? Yeah, it did. In the, in the end, I, I in the beginning I thought it wasn't, but then in the end, yes, because now you had... He, when you went out of the field, you, they would put you in what they call, even in the old days, they put you in a, what they call a, a, a combat trains. In that combat trains was the mess section, the ammo section, the um, administrative section. They were into the, more to the rear, but that was so you could go to the forward areas or the fall. And what, what I would do with it, it was a, combina uh, a consolidated mess. So I would keep the same guys in the same company. They worked for me, but they knew who their men were, and they knew how many men had to be fed and what what the guys liked. And I tried to leave it that way, so that the guys would, you know, they knew their own men and they could feed their own men how they fed their own men. Were all of them cooking the same thing though? Oh yeah, everything was the same. So every single soldier was getting the same getting meal. Getting the same meal, yes, yes. And it was uh, the master men you told you what was for lunch, breakfast, or dinner, you know. And that's what you did. We, we talked a little bit about the changes in food service since you were in the business for so long. Um, can you just briefly go over what you saw? I mean, you, from when you first started working with food, it was three meals a day, three hot meals mm -hmm. a day. Um, and was it all fresh food? Yeah, it was. Majority of it was fresh food. It was all was a, with a, that's what they call it an A ration, and um, but you, because I say when you went out in the field, you had you had what they call the ice trailers and the ice, but and we had trailers, uh, refrigerated trailers too that would be supporting us in the rear that were our ration breakdown that we could bring the the food would be cold. When you got it out there, when you put it on, of course, you had to put it on the ice. But the what, way you would draw the meals were, you usually drew three meals at a time. And you always had enough equipment to keep that food fresh for the troops. You know, for three meals worth. For three meals worth. Then the next time, you would go back, and you used to get a, like a, it, it was a, maybe a supper, a breakfast, a dinner and maybe another supper, but in the meantime, your other guy, you had some guys that were going down from, from your ration break down from the unit because you had a separate section that picked up your rations for you and they would drop them off to you and put them in, you know. But uh, it, was a, it was a big ongoing thing. It's, it's changed today from what I hear talking to the people. But Even from the time you were in, how did it evolve from those three meals, three hot meals a day? I know then you talked that it evolved to lightening up the lunch meal and then eliminating the lunch meal and just giving them the combat ration. Up. Yeah, it, well, it was it was a way of uh, I I it was a way of of making the training a lot easier for the troops themselves and the mess. And that's why I looked at it anyway. It was a lot easier for the cooks that were putting out those meals. But now, in today now, you, I think the, from what I've talked to some of the guys, in fact, one of the guys who's a mess sergeant in my son's unit, uh, he was a cook for me way back. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, every time I see him, it's, you know. Do they but, cook three meals a day anymore? Oh, uh, no. They, they're they using uh, MREs and stuff. And for for all three not, meals? No, but what they're doing now is they're bringing, 
stuff in there so it's even cooked. All they got to do is heat it up in trays and stuff like that. And they don't like it. A lot of cooks want to go back to being basic cooks. Put it in there. They said they're starting to do that. They complained enough that they're starting to do it. Because on the state master menu, everything was, a lot of it was these canned prepared meals already. And I mean, I mean, I, I remember before I left, they were, and after I left going back to see some of the units, they were using like breakfast, Jimmy Dean sausage sandwiches and stuff, you know. The, I, oh, excuse me, you know, the kids, you know, that's not for, as far as I'm concerned, for a soldier, that's not a, a real pick me up meal, especially in the morning, you know, eating a Jimmy St. Jean sausage sandwich. Nah, nah, you know. When did the MREs come in? I would say late 70s. What do they Early 80s, about? maybe. Well, the first MREs meals were, we'd prefer, we actually, we prefer, I, a lot of us preferred the old sea rice and the can, but the MRE meals, a lot of them was freeze dried and dehydrated food, and you had to have a lot of water. And you had your, and you had a little envelope, you put the food in separate to heat them up. Today, they're fantastic. I say they're fantastic, you know, if you got to eat three a day if you're in combat, maybe it's a different story, but they have uh, Chinese food, they have um, uh, vegetarian food in a package, and a whole bunch of different stuff that we never saw. When we saw them, it was all like freeze-dried stuff, you know, and like, you could, you could, if you were out in the woods and you were hungry, you could take the hamburger out and not put any water on it and chew on it, like, you know, nah, nah. <laughs> Because it was already cooked anyway, but you know, you know, but. Well, so you saw a lot of changes. Yes. When you went back in, how long did you stay in before you retired? The I, st well, I, I retired in 1994, finally, March of 94. So, hmm. I had my 30 years in, and, and I guess it was about time. I could probably stay longer. There was a couple of situations and I said, finally, I got out, you know, but, and it wasn't for the fact that it was anything militarily. It was just people that were in charge now were not the same, you know, put it that way and leave it that way, you know. Now, you're part of the 102nd Infantry. Yes. Under, are all, were all of those units part of the 102nd Infantry? No, the uh, units that I was in were under the 43rd Brigade, which was the Brigade of 40. In the beginning, it was the 43rd Division, yep. and then it became a separate brigade, 43rd Brigade, except for the engineer units. They were under under uh, under a different state headquarters, but all the other units were part of the 43rd Brigade. And that's part of the 102nd? That was, the 102nd was part of the 43rd Brigade, because the history of the 102nd goes back to World War One. Of course, they go back further, but World War One, when the 102nd was formed, they were in the 26th Division out of Massachusetts. During World War Two, they were in the 43rd Division, and then after World War Two, uh, during the Korean War, they were still in the 43rd, and then back in the, I believe it was the early 70s. Yeah, it had to be the early 70s. They fell back underneath the 26th Division again in Massachusetts. And then they were under uh, the 92nd or the 29th after that, after I got out. But the last last time I was in the 102nd, we were under the, under the 26th Division, 43rd Brigade. There's been quite a few, bit, quite a few changes since I got in. Fred, did you always have enough supplies? Were there ever any shortages? Not with us guys. We, you know, our our supply routes were good, real good. The, the guys who were in charge of supplies always made sure that our troops ate and they got the equipment they needed. You know, I I would say ne ne there was never a shortage of rations. If there was a shortage, it was your fault because you put the wrong numbers in. Oh. Okay. <laughs> You know. Was there, did you feel any pressure or stress on the job? I think the pressure more than anything else to make sure the meal got out on time. 
you know, that was the pressure right there, just to make sure that the troops... Your mission was to make sure that the, the troops were fed and they got, they got their meals on time or close to on time. And there was one time I think I, I can tell stories about certain people, but guy came in, we were, we had just come out of the field, we were in Indian Town, I'll never forget this, we were in Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. Indian Town? Indian Town Gap. And uh, we we had a night, to, we had to wait till night time to move back into garrison, because we were coming field to garrison. And uh, we had put out, we got back in the garrison, none of the cooks went to bed, they stayed up because we had to make breakfast that morning in the garrison. Well, we did a great breakfast, but now we had no ration. We had to wait. We had to go to ration breakdown to get the next meal, the new meal. And they happened to give us chicken that was frozen. I mean, I can tell you, never think about this. but And so being it was frozen chicken, you had to boil it first before you could do anything because you don't want to give them raw chicken. So we were like six minutes late to the chow. And there was this first sergeant from another unit eating in our mess hall. And he comes in, and he was the first one in the chow line. And by regulations, those are the last guys eat. Make sure their troops eat first, but this guy was a whack nut. I, I call him a whack nut. Well, he come in, and he starts complaining to my head counter. was, you know, bing, 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 bing. And he got in the chow line. He, said, he got the chow and sat down. Well, I walked over, and I asked him. I won't use the vernacular that was used. But I said to him, excuse me, First Sergeant, but uh, what's the problem? All your mess all is horrible. I'll say horrible, okay? And you cooks don't know what they're doing because we're five minutes late, you know? So, and you don't like the food, First Sergeant? No, I don't. I think your food's horrible. Okay. I said, good say, well, do me a favor, First Sergeant. Pick up your tray and get the blank, the blank out of my mess all, you know? He goes, what? You heard me. Pick up your tray and get out of my mess hall. In the meantime, now my first sergeant comes down. I shouldn't be telling the story on camera. You don't know. And he says, Sergeant Horner, what's the problem? I said, I just drew this guy out of your mess hall. Well, the commander, he, the battalion commander and the battalion sergeant major wanted to see me. What the problem is. <laughs> so he leaves. He Grabs his tray, dumps his food in the garbage can, and leaves. I walk up to the commander. I saluted, you know, played the game. And she said, Sergeant Horn, what's the problem down there? I said, well, Colonel, that first sergeant just told me that your mess hall stinks. He said, okay. I walked away. He said, that's all I want to know. You know, I handled it. I handled it right, I guess, according to the battalion. That was the I end I didn't of that was the end of it. He, he, when I told him that this first sergeant said your mess all stinks, he said, okay. <laughs> you know, he, he, sometimes you can get away with that, and of course, sometimes you can't, you know? Depending. Yep. Um, was dessert part of the meal? Yes, it was. You always had to have a dessert. And I could tell you a funny story about desserts, you though. Tell me. Okay, we were at Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. And you remember the uh, hostess snowballs? Yeah. Okay. Well, there was like what they call a forced issue of them. We had snowballs, you know, tons of them. Every dessert was a hostess snowball on the field, you know. It ended up we had a snowball fight up at Camp Edwards, you know. With the hopes of snowballs. It was the middle of summer, so it couldn't be a regular snowball fight, but we had a snowball fight at uh, Camp Edwards. That was the famous snowball fight at Camp Edwards, I think it was 19 in the early 70s. It was, you know. <laughs> it's like now it's Girl Scout cooking. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, so, what kinds of things, when you were getting <laughs> snowballs, would you get? Well, we baked pies. We, we did anything that mom would make at home. We made in the mess hall. Baked. I had one kid who was a darn good baker, real good baker. 
and he made the best chocolate chip cookies I can remember. And he was a, he was a quiet kid, but get him in the get him in, when we were in garrison, especially in garrison, when we had the stove and everything. He was doing all the baking for the battalion. What was your civilian job? Here you're doing all this cooking. Uh, oh, were you a cooking civilian life? Uh, for a while, but you know what my job was? I worked pest control. <laughs> yeah, I was a I worked pest control for bliss exterminating. I was out there killing the roaches and the rats and the mice. You probably saw lots of kitchens from a different perspective. Oh, well, let me tell you. I could tell you places that I was in, oh, in civilian life that would never got by me in the military. Having been in both of those roles, um, how would you rate the military kitchens? Uh, excellent. Very good. I will say one thing. When we were on the old base of Fort Lee, at one time at Fort Lee, I do remember, because I wasn't doing that then at that time. The old bake shop at Fort Lee we had little friends crawling around on the wall. But, you know, that was down south, too, you know, and everything else. And, and it, we would walk in the morning, turn the lights on, drink, but, you know, nothing ever got into where you were baking or anything because we made sure of that, you know. But until they they finally tore the building down and gave them a new bake shop, I guess, you know, after I left. But, but, but going out there in civilian life, uh, there are restaurants today that I wouldn't go to. Do you still cook at home? Yes, I do. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do that today because my wife's working right now, and uh, I told her I'll cook supper for you tonight. So she said, what are you cooking me? Like, <laughs> I just I got to get along with my wife, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? I went in the freezer, pull out a couple lamb chops. I'll make a lamb chops tonight, I guess. Yeah. Was it difficult transitioning from cooking for hundreds of people to cooking for just a few? Not really, because uh, yeah, no, and the recipes are different. But if I could take a, I could take a recipe for cooking for a hundred, cook for five or six. You just have to break it down. You have to sit there and figure out how much you got to use, you know, because it's right, it's formulated right out there for you anyway. You know? Uh, I still can add one and one is five, but... <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of your fellow servicemen? 99% uh, of them, greatest guys in the world. Officer and enlisted. You had that 1% that, you, you know, you didn't want to know, ever know, you know. But I never had a problem... I, I can I can say that uh, there isn't a fellow service man today that I knew that I wouldn't walk up to him and give him a hug and say I you know, I you know and the problem is sometimes you walk up there and I say at my age you walk up there and you say look at him and you go I know you from somewhere where is it and they'll look at you and say, hey Sergeant Horn or something oh God how the hell are you you know it's just but I think you know you. No, I th I think there's there's just something that even in the guard, you have something between you that the guys who never went in the service don't understand. You know, people. I mean, I I go to I go for breakfast every morning at this place in East Haven. It's called the Country Kitchen, and uh, uh, there are some characters in there. You know. In fact, I was with my first, my old, my first sergeant for the foot guard yesterday, and we call the place the dysfunction junction because that's what it is for people in there. But you know, it's, but you get to know people, and yeah, I think I think the service helps you out in one way. You know, it teaches you how to get along with no everybody, no matter what. You just sit there. Yeah, sometimes I think you do get. Uh, but you know enough now just to keep your mouth shut most of the time anyway did you, you know? make any close friendships yes I did I uh, people that you still stay in touch with yeah there's a couple there's a couple uh, but uh, in fact a lot of it is with the uh, the guys that were in the 102nd association with you know 
we kept we kept we have a hundred second association. It's out of New Haven. It's out of the uh, now. It's located at uh, Fort Hill yeah. in New Haven because the New Haven Army ain't there anywhere. But it's like you know, you walk in. It's like you're. It's a brotherhood more than anything else. It's and a where brotherhood. Where is this hundred second association right now? We're, we're out of the uh, uh, Fort Hill, uh, the old naval. Uh, Fort, Hale? Fort Hale. Oh, H-A-L-E. Yeah, it's named after Nathan Hale. Oh. And it's uh, down on uh, in, on Woodward Avenue, New Haven. How but often does the 102nd Association? We meet once a month. And, you know. Did you join any other veterans organizations? I was, I joined the American Legion, but I haven't been there in a couple of years. So I, just, I just don't have time to go to it on a Thursday night, you know. You know, it's like every other organization. Even like I joined the Foot Guard, you know. Um, what are your responsibilities in the Foot Guard? I used to be, I I used to run, well, I was, a, I ended up being the Foot Guard Sergeant Major for a while. Then I retired and I ran the club, the, uh, the NCO club. And I ran it for God from 2006 to this last year. But it's just not the same anymore. It's, you, know, you haven't got that many people anymore. Any organization today is the same way. I don't know if the youth don't care or that they don't care or that they they got other things to do in their life than join organizations, you know. And it's, it's a shame in a way because especially like with the foot guard, it's an historical unit, you know, the government foot guard. And there should be more people just there to go out and do the ceremonies, like because the foot guard now is more of a ceremony you know, than anything else. And it's, it's the you know we're always there. I don't march anymore because I used to do that, but that's partially because I'm retired too. I just you know you get too old for it, I guess, as they say. But Fred, I also know you're heavily involved with the museum that we're in today, the yes. Haven Veterans Museum and Learning Center. What's your role here? Right now it's, um, I, I usually run these kids through a museum that are come through. I had, that last year was, was probably what made me very happy after a long time was the fact that I what about 600, went through what about 600 kids, or maybe not 600, 500 and change, that went through the museum to show them the history of their country. It was nice to explain the eras to them, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and the First War, that some of these kids don't even know about. And it's scary. That's what's scary. How too. did you get involved with the museum? Oh, I got involved with the museum... Uh, Back when it was in the New Haven Armory in 1993, Mr. Carano, I happened to, with the museums of 93, when we first formed in New Haven Armory. And one thing that Mr. Carano, I, he said, someday I'm going to make you famous, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so this museum started off as a small little museum in the New Haven Armory? Yeah, well, what happened was... Um, New Haven Gray's Room that we have. Well, you've seen the Gray's Room. That was the original museum. And well, it was a, a meeting. It was an A Company's orderly room, but that's where Frank started collecting. Was Mr. Carano, so Sergeant Carano, started collecting things from the armory because the problem was things were disappearing. He said, "I'm going to collect it and put it in a museum." So, and he has General Gay was out there too. He's got his stuff out there. One that one of the and a general character were the guys who helped start the museum. When and did you move to this larger facility? It's got to be two years now. Two years in November on November 11th. We got here before that, but our open, grand opening was uh, Armistice Day two years ago, or Arm Veterans Day yeah. two years ago. <laughs> Slap me for that one. <laughs> so you've been involved for. For a very long time. Yes. Do you plan? Uh, I know you're still getting older. You plan on sticking with uh, 
museum? I, I plan to stay until I can't do it anymore. Because not only that I that being a member of the 102nd and being a member of this museum, I like I look at it this way. I got family history with this museum with my grand pictures of my grandfather all over the place, you know, in two places. Uh, I had a grandfather who was in the regiment in 1898, and my father's, my father's father, you know. And it's like the family's been in this unit for years. And when I joined it, when I found out that my grandfather was here, that's and when they, they told me, I, they called me up and said, you want to join? I said, yeah, I'll come into the unit. And that's right. And then when you, uh, I got my old, my son was also a member of the unit, so. There's family ties to this thing that make me want to stay to like, you know, I got the walker or the, you know, <laughs> you know. Now, the 102nd, how is that tied to this museum? I, I know that the museum is for all military. Yes. But is there a special focus on the 102nd infantry? Yeah, because a lot of the stuff that's in here is originally, it was originally in the 102nd. And what happened was that Beth Sabo, she works for the, she works for the town of West Haven, came over because we were looking for a home for the museum. And when she saw the museum, New Haven didn't want us. Truthfully, New Haven didn't want us. And Beth, with Beth Sabo, was one of the persons when she saw us in New Haven that she wanted us here in West Haven. And that gentleman, Marty, the grand who owned the building, he was had a lot of things to do with West Haven when it was for the veterans too, because he was a veteran. And they were looking for, we were look, we looked in three or four different places here in West Haven for our museum. We had gotten a couple of buildings, then Marty said, why don't you take my building here and put it in this building? And that's, we've been, and I, uh, I, myself, I could probably put a tear in my eye, but I am so happy we're here because our stuff was in a, a warehouse for 10 years, okay? And nobody, n nobody could see it. It wasn't there, you know? What do you see as a future for the museum? I, I hope we, uh, we continue on, of course, with the new railway station being built here, and uh, j not alone, just for the fact that we get, in the spring, we get kids from the school here to show them their history. And the, when I did that first group here, I, I, I always said, I, and this is what I say to them, I said, we're here as a museum to show you your history, not our history, it's your history, because this is how you got your freedom to go to school today with all these people that are here from Benedict Arnold and Revolutionary War, even though he was, as they say, well, he was a traitor or somebody else, you know, till everybody who fought, ever fought in any of our wars, you know, and as I say, guardsmen themselves, not only that fought in the war, they've done other things, the tornadoes, the floods, the snowstorms, etc. that our mission was in the guard, you know. So I remember being called off for the tornado in 19, the 70s, up at uh, Bradley Field. Uh, we got called out for the uh, Bobby Seal trial in New Haven, too, and all that. And a few other times when I, when I was in, we got called out for different things, you know. And... Uh, it's part, it's, it's part of, I say, what this country is, and we can't lose it. Fred, how would you say that your military experience affected your life? It, it had to change it to the point, I think, to the better. Some people will probably say, no, you did the, you did. but yeah, it, it, it has made it a lot of things worthwhile that weren't worthwhile before, you know, you, you know, but of course, knowing the history, you don't want it to end, you don't want this country to end, and 
probably, you know, there's times, of course, in the military, you, you get you get beat on and everything else, but what the heck? That's life, too. You can get beat on in light, regular life, too. Fred, is there anything else that you'd like to add that I haven't asked you about during this interview? Just, uh, I'd like to, like to thank you personally and your group personally for the interest in that you give not only us, but you give the veterans because if, if we didn't have people like you, it would, I don't think it would be, it would be done. I just think they write everything, they like people like to write, just forget about everything. No. Well, it's, it's our honor and privilege. I'd like to thank you for your service and all that you've done. Thank you. But I always say I didn't do that much. <laughs> <laughs>